Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. It is Saturday, March 2nd. This is Evoke Therapy Programs broadcast. I am Dr. Brad Reedy, the clinical director and co-founder of Evoke Therapy Programs. So welcome to this Saturday afternoon edition of our broadcast. And today's broadcast is on codependency and co-participation. Now, I intentionally label it codependency and co-participation because I, I want to distinguish the idea from being in a relationship to an addict and having codependency in general. If you've ever attended a, a codependency meeting, an Al-Anon meeting or a CODA meeting, Families Anonymous meeting, what you'll hear, one of the phrases that you'll hear is and uh, the, the qualifier. Who is your qualifier? Who are you related to that, that punches your ticket, qualifies you to, to show up to this meeting? And what I say about myself is I don't need a qualifier to look at, be aware of, and work on my own codependency. I talk about the idea that I feel guilty when it rains and I get mail, that the mailman has to get, get rained on. So it, it, there, there's this dynamic that's present in and, and around being related to or having a loved one who's an addict or an alcoholic or mental health issues. I want to point that out very clearly. It's not just about addiction, but it's also about mental health issues and really anything that's self-sabotaging. There, there's a dynamic that we can call co-participation, but codependency is a human condition about being in relationship to other people in an undifferentiated way. So codependency is a pop psychology term. It's not a clinical diagnosis, and it's used to describe a, a phenomenon about being in relationship to somebody and, and not having clear boundaries with them, relying on them for your esteem, for your well-being, for your sense of peace, joy, and serenity. So codependency is a, uh, an idea, a, a feature in relationships that really everybody is somewhere on the, com uh, the continuum. And co-participation, at least in my language, this is my term, is when it shows up in relationship to somebody who's struggling with addiction or with mental health issues or any self-sabotaging behavior. Codependency is co-participation if we are to contribute to the health of our children whom we love. This is in the context, of course, of children who struggle. Then we need to focus first on the relationship with ourselves, then with our children. Only then we can see the relationship that we have with our child's problems. There's a psychologist that, that I was just reading about yesterday who says any relationship problem we have with another person is really evidence of a relationship problem that we have with ourselves. And so that's why I talk about so emphatically the idea of do your own work first. And I know a lot of you attending today aren't novices to this. And so you've heard me use that phrase. For those of you who are new to this work, you're going to hear me say it a lot, that the best thing you can do, that the greatest contribution you can make to anybody that you care about, maybe most particularly your children, is to do your own work. So let's talk a little bit about codependency. Codependency has expanded into a definition which describes a dysfunctional pattern of living and problem solving developed during childhood by family rules. In other words, we come by this honesty, honestly. This idea that, that our parents um, were, were treated us in such a way to believe that when they were upset or happy, we were good when they were worried or angry or frustrated, we were bad or doing something bad, is the root of codependency. In other words, my identity, who I am, is determined by how you feel. And that has its roots in childhood. And unfortunately, I've done the same thing to my children. I, I've learned this in the past decade and a half about codependency, but early on, <clears throat> I used to think and, and teach and live by the idea that when I was upset, when I was happy with my children, that that was just a natural consequence of their behavior. And that I would reflect that back to them, hoping that they would interpret it as evidence as, as, evidence as to whether they were doing well or not. I, I don't think I'm unique in that. I think that idea is... is prevalent in our society and in families. So that's where it has its roots. And 
our, our parents raised us that way, right? I mean, we, we've grown as a culture in awareness. And so I think this issue was more prevalent even, even though it's plenty ple- prevalent today, it was more prevalent in our childhoods, right? We believed our parents' feelings about us or towards us or about our behavior were a reflection of us. We took no account, nobody, nobody took any account that a, a good percentage, if not all of it, was about them. You know, their feelings were theirs. We were taught it was modeled that we should own them. Now, the problem is, is that we grow up and become parents and have children, and we do the same thing to our children. We, we parent them in the same way, but a more insidious dynamic is, in codependency, is that our children's happiness with us, our children's disappointment disappointment in us or what we say or we, what we do when they say, I don't feel loved, when, when they express any emotional experience about us, towards us, related to us, we think it's about us because the wiring happened long ago in our brains. And so part of the idea of, a de- of detachment, right, pulling that apart, which by the way I'll talk about tonight, really is healthy attachment, but we call it detachment because it feels like a pulling apart. The, the differentiation that happens when we separate out what we feel and think from what our children feel and think and are and what they feel and think is separated from what we think and what we are. We start to heal from our codependency. Codependency is a lay term that can be applied to various forms and styles in relating to others where there's a lack of self, a lack of, of healthy intimacy, that can take on the form of overconnected or disconnected. So, so codependency is about a lack of intimacy. And stylistically, it can look like overconnected or disconnected, but they're really at the core, they're the same thing. They're the inability to be close and connected to somebody and maintain a sense of self. Overconnected gets a little bit confusing sometimes because. People don't associate over, excuse me, disconnected. I'll go back. Disconnected is sometimes uh, misunderstood because people think, well, well, isn't codependency kind of overlapping and over-involvement and and, and enmeshed by by nature? But sometimes disconnection is a response to feeling overconnected and overwhelmed. I remember a young woman talking about her father and how he would reject her if she expressed her feelings and thoughts about certain things. And she said he's, you know, he's he would just break off the relationship, not talk to me. And I mentioned, I said, I said, your dad's really fragile then. And she looked at me with a quizzical look and she said, fragile, I don't I don't understand what you mean. My father's really, really strong. And I said, but he's fragile in the sense that he's not flexible. He's not able to stay in the relationship and work through the difficulty. And so that the, the cutoff or the disconnection is evidence of that fragile, rigid nature. A codependent person is one who has let another person's behavior affect him or her and who is obsessed with controlling, curing, or correcting that person's behavior. In other words, for us codependents, we can't or we, we struggle to realize that the problem is in here, in us. And therefore, the solution is in here, in us. So we see somebody who's overtly, obviously, legitimately struggling, and we think to ourselves, if I can fix them, especially with our children, maybe mostly with our children, although siblings, parents, significant others, it it also very much applies to them. If I can fix my child, if I can get them on the road to recovery, I can regain my serenity, and that becomes our project. In my work around codependency, and this is really important, in my work, the solution isn't in the doing. You will not hear me say, kick your child out of your house, or let them back in for that matter. What you will hear me talk about is learning to be in a different kind of relationship with your child learning to be in a differentiated relationship with your child, out of that awareness, 
will come your truth and your decision about whether or not to set those kinds of boundaries with your children. But, but you won't hear me recommend those kinds of boundaries as the solution to the problem. That's not the, the problem, nor is it the solution. Divorce is not <clears throat> the solution. It may be uh, something that comes out of the solution of a different way of living, but it's not the solution, or, or not getting divorced is not the solution. One of the many vet definitions of codependency is a set of maladaptive, compulsive behaviors learned by family members in order to survive in a family which is experiencing great emotional pain and distress. In fact, one of my triggers are red flags. Red flags is a better, better analogy. One of my red flags that my codependency is active is when I am obsessing and responding without compulsively without thought, right? I'm not filtering, I'm not reflecting, I'm not taking time. I'm thinking about how to fix or change somebody. I'm rehearsing conversations in my head. I'm anticipating responses and coming up with rebuttals ahead of time. This can go on for, for minutes to, to hours to days. And then I know I'm living in my codependency. The opposite is showing up and speaking my truth and letting the chips fall where they made and letting the other person have their reaction. Or when somebody is, is acting, acting in such a way, doing something in my life, somebody that I care about, I can take a moment and breathe and don't feel the, the, the urge to act Im impulsively or compulsively. I've said this before. You know, it's not all the same in all the programs and all the groups all the time, but when I was out in the field, parents would get letters on a Thursday evening. I would bring letters in from the field, sometime in other groups and programs. It gets, it's on Wednesday or, or different days, but I would come in from the field on Thursday evening. I would give the letters to, to the secretaries in the office, and I would then drive home. It was a two-hour drive most of the time. And if by the time I got home, I found in my inbox any letters, especially letters that were five, six, seven pages long from a parent in response to their child's letter, I almost always discovered that that letter was not a, a helpful one to send. It could be cathartic, kind of like journaling, but oftentimes I would ask the parents to pause. There was no, the child wasn't going to get it for four days anyway, right? It wasn't going to go back out to the field until Tuesday morning anyway. So, so logistically, pragmatically, there was no need, but <clears throat> there was a, a compulsive response by the parent. There's no shame in that. It just is an indicator of the kind of reactivity you live in, in, in these kind of codependent relationships. We carry around our own internal sense of how much or, and how to connect to others. We recreate these same qualities essentially in our relationships until we develop a new sense of relating to others. So this is about how we relate to others. The new book that I'm, I'm writing is, is the working title is Being Human, What It Means to Be a Self and to Love Another. It's, it's that broad. That, that's really what the, the journey of the heroic parent was about, although it has the title parent, and it's really about what does it mean to be in relationship with somebody else? What does it mean to be a self? Who am I? Where do I stop and where do you start? And vice versa, where do you stop and where do I start? And then more and more awareness in answer to those questions is absolutely liberating and empowering for the person doing the work. Symptoms of codependency, low self-worth. Uh, often oscillating between shame and grandiosity, from deflation to inflation. I talk about I was talking about this with a client not too long ago. There are times after a, a nice session where somebody seems to have a really great aha moment, where I walk away and I'm I'm proud of myself. I think, wow, I really have this therapy thing together. And then there are other times after an interaction when I I think to myself. Do I have 
anything at all to contribute to anybody in the world, right? That's my own codependency, the, the inflation and the deflation. And of course, the more work that we do in this area, the more that that inflation, deflation dynamic levels off some. There's often relief behaviors, medicators needing to numb or distract ourselves. I remember thinking about in our school district, when my first two children were in high school, they had something called power school. Uh, I think most communities have it. It's an online grade portal for parents. And I used to say, this thing is absolutely diabolical. It is jet fuel for codependence. And there were times when my wife and I would be addicted to power school, and then we'd be questioning our children, and we'd be asking them about assignments that weren't recorded or turned in. And, and it became crazy-making. After a, a couple of years, a few years, I finally said, I'm just not going to look at that anymore. Because in looking at that, I can't maintain my sense of self. In other words, my codependency, my disease is active. So I'm not going to look at it to maintain my sense of health and avoidance of my disease of codependency. So that's the, the, the behaviors, the, the rituals. External referencing, caretaking control, right? The, the, the Maybe one of the more fundamental ideas of codependency is what you think about me is about me, right? Think about the four agreements. If you want to read a book about that, think about the four agreements. If you happen to go to an Al-Anon meeting or a CODA meeting or a Families Anonymous meeting, you'll hear the phrase eventually, what you think about me is none of my business. That's the, the mantra or the antidote to, to this kind of codependent thinking. But again, we came by it honestly. We were taught. I, I've heard it taught by therapists in the field lately. The therapists believe that, that parents and, and therapists, for that matter, are supposed to show the client, the student, a display of emotions, an I feel statement, because this is a natural consequence. Right? This is feedback. This is a reflection of who you are, not necessarily of who I am. Self-awareness, deficits, dissociation, perfectionism, right? Not, not really knowing what it means to be a self not being really connected to the self. Boundary struggles, obviously, either too porous or, or too walled off and disconnected. I described that already. Attachment difficulties, over-dependent, anti-dependent. Similar to the previous idea. Too close or, or too far apart are really other sides of the same coin. They're really both the opposite of healthy intimacy, healthy attachment and healthy detachment, a loss of balance, right? Parents, spouses, children who have an addict in their family or somebody struggling with mental health or self-sabotage end up becoming reactive, highs and lows, overcompensating. They, they find it difficult to find balance because they're always trying to create balance in the relationship. And if somebody else is out of balance, which is one of the core features or descriptors of an, of an addict, if I'm trying to create balance with somebody who's, who's out of balance, then I'm going to end up out of balance. Right? Like the teeter-totter. The farther away you move from center, the farther away I move from center to compensate. I see that in co-parenting all the time. A powerlessness, an identity of hopelessness, helplessness, haplessness. Right? A defeated kind of mentality. I don't like the word victim because I think it has shameful connotations to it. I, it's just not my favorite. It's okay, I, I guess, but it doesn't work for me. But it's that idea of it's not my fault and I can't fix it and I can't solve it and I'm hopeless. And, and simply put, if we focus on things that we can't control, right? This is pretty simple. The, in the past, present or future, if we focus on things we can't control, we're more prone to depression and anxiety. Hypervigilance, scanning the outside. If you grew up in a family where there was 
mental health or addiction, you probably developed this char characteristic there, right? I have to constantly, because I'm on a battlefield, I grew up on the battlefield, I have to constantly look out and read the room, see what's going on, anticipate, predict what people are going to, you know, if my alcoholic father walks into the room, I have to look at the look on his face. I get really, really good at reading people because my well-being and safety depend upon it. It's a trauma response. A loss of joy, terminal seriousness. When I do parent support groups, I see that with parents, the, the battle to struggle with a child who has life-threatening mental health and, 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 and addictive behaviors. It's, it's difficult. I, I, I humbly sit with them and realize I can't fix this problem that you're presenting. And of course, in our work in codependency and recovery, we focus on regaining our own serenity in the context of such a, a dire situation, which is really challenging and requires a lot of support, both from individuals like a therapist or, or a sponsor or from group, from group support. Over personalizing and taking everything personally. Back to the four agreements, right? One of the four agreements is don't take everything personally. But again, if I have, and I do, have this narcissist. Can you see me now? Can you hear me? All right. I'm just going to take off from where we were. My internet just went down for a moment, so I'll have to edit and splice things together. Let me click a couple of buttons. Testing, testing, there it is. Okay. Great. Where was I? So. In, in summary, if you grew up in a family where there was trauma, if you've experienced trauma, you've developed this capacity to read your environment, protect yourself from potential threats, <clears throat> right? The idea being that if you can see it far enough in advance, you can avoid it. So hypervigilance and scanning the outside is a common characteristic. It's similar to the idea. It's connected to the idea that everything is about you, right? Because if I can see a far off a threat and, and learn how to maneuver, then it's not going to happen when really it was something for the most part that was beyond your control whatsoever. 
loss of joy, loss of this terminal seriousness that happens. They say in, 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 in the work that your serenity is your responsibility. Um, Over-personalizing, taking everything personal. I've talked about that. We tend to be in a power struggle because if the idea is to control another so that I'm at peace, then I'm going to get in a power struggle, right? If the solution to the issue is that I control you, then you can see the seeds and the foundation for power struggle. It's going to be there consistently. Other characteristics of codependency, poor boundaries. It's, it's one will allow for more abuses in a codependent, codependent relationship, and that makes all the sense in the world, doesn't it? Because if you're codependent, you have no, or you have a compromised sense of self, so you're more likely to allow people, you don't even have a reference point. You don't know whether or not how you're being treated is okay or not, because that doesn't enter into the, the equation. That is why I talk so, so, so much about the idea that when you start making decisions from a place of self, from a place of what you need or feel comfortable with, it changes the equation. And that's in contrast to trying to figure out what decisions you need to make to fix the kid so the kid is okay. Poor self-care, right? Codependence, we codependence. Don't even know what that means. And, and aren't inclined to do it because we're so programmed with guilt. Right? We're programmed to believe that guilt is our conscience. To have, to, we were taught that to feel guilty is somehow an indication that we've done something wrong when it's not necessarily true at all. And my experience uh, myself in working with clients is that unless you're doing battle with guilt, you're probably not making progress in areas of self-care because you're going to feel guilty when you take care of yourself. We're not, we're not wired to take care of ourselves. We're wired to take care of everybody else. And then if somebody in our family, especially our children, are upset, then we've done something wrong because that's what our parents taught us. The facade of selfless, but feel self-care self -care from others. In other words, most codependents value the idea of selflessness. They aspire to be selfless. But what they end up doing is kind of stealing, borrowing at least, from others. They can't ask for it assertively. They can't demand it via a boundary assertively. So they, they ask for it passively. They end up requiring from others around them. Perfectionism, the idea that we can get it right. I talk about this idea all the time. That there are two soups that we get cooked in. There's the soup of, of right and wrong and the soup of self. And those are two very different equations. And if we were cooked in the soup, which most were, of right and wrong, then we think we can get it right, which ensures our failure instead of just being a self. Believes that their love will cure others. Even after they get... Some some beginning pieces of work under their belt. They oftentimes think, now I can now I have enough. Now I have the tools where I can cure them, keep them sober, keep them clean, keep them on the right path. Gets needs met indirectly, has difficulty asking for their needs to be met. We'll have a difficult time tolerating those helping them, right? It's no accident that, that we codependents often end up in helping professions, like therapists. I rarely meet a therapist worth their, 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 the, worth their fee that doesn't have or hasn't struggled with and worked on their codependency. It's what gets us into the idea of being a therapist. And then, of course, like I said in my first book, it's the thing that we spend the rest of our careers trying to resist our codependent urges. Blames others for misery. We do this as parents. We say to our children over and over again how upset we are at their illicit drug use. 
their self-harm, their eating disorders. And in other words, we're blaming them for our happiness. I can't, you can only be as happy as your least happy child, right? That idea, that insane idea that's rarely challenged. We become too responsible for problems. We make cause and effect connections. I, I've, I've tried to do this. I think in my early broadcasts back in 2007, I think I didn't do as good of a job as I can do now, which is to separate out the cause and effect. In fact, after a while, I would put not cause and effect. There would be a slide on every single webinar, every single, single broadcast, just to remind me and listeners that I wasn't teaching you about things that would fix your child. I was teaching you things really that would fix you, which then contribute, don't cause, but contribute to the health of your child. Tendency to place the needs and wants of others first and to the exclusion of knowledge in one's own. Again, sometimes we aspire to this. Sometimes we think that this is the goal in relationships. Lots of anxiety, boundary distortions relating to intimacy and separation. When I work with violent offenders, this idea that, that this violence was kind of a, a last resort to, of trying to control a person instead of self-mastery. Difficulty expressing feelings, excessive worry about how, how others might respond to their feelings. This is a core concept in codependency. Because we've had to monitor our environment, predict, practice what we say, so, so it's to control how other people would feel and treat us, this was a survival instinct on our part, or a learned survival um, behavior on our part. Then we do it with our children. And we, we euphemistically refer to this as loving them too much, and it's not. It has nothing to do with love at all. It has to do with the quality that we possess to be in relationship to another person in an intimate and differentiated way. We have an undue fear of being hurt or rejected by others, right? We, we place too much weight on that. There's a line that I, that I borrowed from the, the musical Wicked, where Alphaba, at the end of Act 1, is talking about the wizard, for those of you who have seen it, and she's being asked to compromise her integrity. And she says, if, if this is love, this acceptance is love, then it comes at much too high a cost. And she decides to go out and live her authentic self, which she gets vilified for, by the way. Self-esteem becomes dependent on approval by others. I'm saying the same thing in, in dozens of different ways. Others determine our value, our worth, our rightness, our goodness, our badness, our worthiness, our acceptance, and our value. This is the core. Now, I, I want to pause here because I haven't thought about it in this context, but I wrote something on Instagram and, 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 and on my social media the other day about this toxic message that is in our culture where we can't depend upon other people or how we feel. But what we can do is we can find somebody, like I have somebody in, in the person of my therapist. We can find somebody who learns to value and see the whole self, not just parts of the self, not just the good, the happy, the talented parts of the self, but all of the self, all the words. When we find somebody that can do that, then we walk around with an internal copy that tells us that we're okay. Then, when somebody reacts with anger, frustration, even if I share our children, we don't, we don't assume that it's about us. And what does that do? That creates a capacity to see the child. A tendency to ignore one's own values and attempt to adhere to the values of others. It's like the alphabet quote. I love you and I'm willing to do anything for you that doesn't compromise my needs and my core values. If it, if it does ask me to compromise my important and core needs and values, then it's not love. I, I'm not willing to do it. It lacks a certification 
direct and direct and, and assertive communication, right? People that are codependent farther along the continuum, they don't tell the truth because the truth is risky. The truth doesn't try to control, doesn't try to soften, it doesn't try to uh, smooth it out, doesn't try to grease the skids, if you will. The truth is just the truth. And I'm not talking about unkind, aggressive, insulting truth. I'm talking about honest, authentic, courageous, clear, kind truth. Guilting, lecturing, hoping, resenting, expecting, and blaming, right? All of those emotionally coercive emotions that we put on, that we engage in with other people so as to get them to change. Because here's the key, if you're codependent like me. If I can get you to change, I don't have the boundary. And setting a boundary is the most terrifying thing, the hardest work that I have to do. So if I can get my son, convince my son or my daughter to change, I don't have to set a boundary. So the emotionally coercive stuff is my passive attempt to get him to take care of himself, her to take care of herself, so that I can take care of indirectly. That's codependency. Caring for others is how your worth is measured in codependency, right? How much I love you, that's my only value. Feelings aren't allowed in families where codependency runs rampant, especially in stressful and traumatic situations. Um, we learn that self-care is selfish or wrong. I try not to use the word. I used it a few months back. I used it to describe something in my 11-year-old. My wife looked at me because she knows this value of mine. She's heard me teach it many times. She knows I don't almost ever use it. And I said something to my daughter like, what did you just say? And we laughed. And I said, I know. I, I can't believe I called her selfish. I don't know where that came from. I mean, I do know where it came from. It came from frustration and wanting to shame her into compliance. But I was surprised that it was there. Getting needs, uh, getting your needs directly was not okay. Right? In, in codependent families and families that encourage codependency, taking care of yourself is not okay. Learn that others are more important. Others' needs are more important. Family rules are, are rigid, unexamined, unexplored, uncriticized. Even when I do family of origin with people looking back, you can feel the resistance sometimes to critically look at their family and family members. It's not always the case, but it's often the case that that's evidence that there was this unspoken rule in the family that you don't say anything negative about anybody and that it's your job as a child to prop up the esteem of your parents, because they couldn't. The perpetuation that guilt is a barometer of morality and is used to communicate an obligation to care for another or be responsible for another's feelings. Guilt is not associated with morality, period. It's just not. In my career, much, much more often than not, I have seen guilt explained by the client to be something that got in the way of them something right or authentic because they learned that if they did something guilt is the feeling that uh, of i it's usually expressed with the the phrase i feel bad and that's usually in the context of what i'm doing is hurting somebody else but we can think of a vast number an infinite number of examples where doing the right thing might hurt somebody else's feelings. Family rules and codependent families and families that encourage more, co more codependency, it's not okay to talk about problems, right? Things have to be smooth, happy. In that cartoon, the, the, the Pixar cartoon, um, Inside Out, a few years ago when the daughter was feeling sad about the move, the move from Minnesota to San Francisco, and she was kind of sad at the dinner table, the parents said, where did our good little, where did our happy good little girl go? Feelings should not be expressed openly. Keep feelings yourself. Nobody has any capacity to contain them. Communication is best if indirect. There's a lot of strings attached to behaviors, to gifts, so-called, in these families. The goals are 
to be strong, to be good, be right, to be perfect. Mistakes don't have values, right? That's why I talk about it all the time. Learn to value the struggles and the mistakes. Learn to see the richness and the wisdom in them and, and, and lesson that they're trying to teach. Making us proud beyond realistic expectations, right? This idea that it's our job to make our parents proud. And that that, that becomes a burden that we care. Do as I say, not as I do. I saw a funny quote the other day from a therapist that said, why don't you take my advice? I'm not using it. And I thought that was pretty funny. It's okay to play. It's not okay to be play or, to play or be playful, right? Everything has to have a, 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 a value, a tangible value. And play is less important. Don't rock the boat. Don't things up. And pain and suffering should be avoided at all costs. From my first book, the young woman who believes she is responsible for her mother's feelings will also feel she is responsible when her friends are upset that she doesn't want to go out to a party where there's alcohol. And I could give numberless examples of that. If we wire our children to believe that what we feel is their responsibility, they will go out in the world hanging out peers and believe that peer approval is a reflection of their value and worth. So we are the programs of peer pressure. Parenting traits, the use of guilt and shame, right? That's a go-to. It's easy. Rescuing. Not wanting a child to suffer. Giving them a softer, easier place to land. Overvaluing the child's needs, especially and particularly at your expense. Using threats rather than consequences. Feeling and feeling used and being feeling betrayed, the martyr, like I do everything for you. Therefore, you've got to do this, be grateful, feel a certain way to make me happy. Giving with strings attached. And then we grow up and we, we find it difficult to accept things from people. And it, we didn't, it didn't come by that because we were born neurotic. We came by that because there was an invisible field in our family where it wasn't safe to accept a gift from somebody. Something was expected of us. Worried, helpless, powerless, hopeless. Defends or feels the need to be right, right? When I talk about that with parents all the time. You don't, you don't get to be right anymore. You just get to be you, which is so much better. We make our decisions based on outcomes. We focused on co-parents' faults um, and demonstrated helplessness and powerlessness, right? And in difficult families, we focus on the, that the other parent is not doing or what the other parent has, ca has caused in our children. So in other, other words, we render ourselves helpless because we weren't part of the problem anyway, not to a large degree, of course. I don't love the phrases rescue and enabling. I, I think they're adequate descriptors of behaviors, but I think, again, they have their roots in this deeper sense of self. So I'll just mention a few things. Minimizing, making excuses, rationalizing, justifying denial, or minimizing behavior. And usually it's just bit by bit. It covers up problems both psychologically and behaviorally, eases the pain of others, talks others out of their pain or discomfort, fights battles for the addict, Circumvents natural consequences. Hypervigilant again. Becomes a detective or obsesses. I remember with my first child, I got all kinds of spyware. This is long before he struggled. I got all kinds of spyware on the computer where I would look at keystrokes, look at every website he visited, right? I was always trying to be a detective. I had all kinds of breathalyzers long before he ever had his first drink. I was going to be a good enough detective to prevent any problems. Blame self and others, anyone but the addict. The addict colludes with you on that too. Students and clients, how they show up, um, they oftentimes can be agreeable. That, that's one of the most insidious forms of, of codependency is agreeableness. Hyper-cooperative, pleasing and compliant. They help others first. They focus on, they love to become junior therapists and help other people. They love to be the hero, the white knight, the messiah, the savior. It, it's, it's their only value. 
It's just because they were raised in the family where, where that was their role. It's like the health. I'm very vulnerable to peer pressure. When the group gets difficult, they're, they find it very difficult to stand up to it. Again, because who they're pleasing is important. If they're trying to please me or their parents, that's a problem because I know that leaves them vulnerable to negative peer pressure, right? It's the same science, same neurobiology. Refusal to write impact letters, war stories. Refusal to write those assignments which kind of expose the ugly and difficult side of their emotional process, process and their past. They work too much. They check off boxes. They try to get through the program quickly. They struggle when other children, when other clients in the group are struggling. You know, the question comes to me when I talk about codependency because most people can relate to several of the characteristics. Is everybody codependent? And really, again, like I said at the outset, it's really a continuum where on one side we have intimacy, connection, balance, assertiveness. That's the self side, a healthy self side. On the other side, we have relationships marked by power and control, managing others' crisis, selfless to a fault, passive and passive aggressive. So think of it not as a binary of, of codependent versus not codependent, but rather what features, what characteristics, characteristics do I have? How do you get out of it? Well, you go to al -Anon. You listen to other people who have navigated the course a little bit longer than you. Um, it's an addiction to crisis, drama, chaos, imbalance, stress, and disorder. It's chemically reinforced in your brain. So it's going to take a little bit more than just common sense thinking or a self-help book. Focus on what you can control, which is you. That's all you can control. If you want to do deeper family of origin work, therapy, at an intensive, for example, you challenge your family of origin rules, the processes. Practice and prepare for detachment. Healthy attachment will feel like detachment to somebody who struggles more with codependency. It will feel like not caring. Learning to let go of the outcome. You know, I remember when I was in Little League and I was pitching. If I got to in my head, I had to be pulled from the game because I started aiming the ball. And the more you aim the ball, the worse you get at control. You have to trust your motion. Trust your throw. <clears throat> and I'm sure that that's true in a lot of sports, art. If you try to control it, you lose your creativity, your power, your accuracy. Telling the truth is, is being honest is all you have control over. You don't have a control over how it lands, how they react. Replacing fear and anxiety with faith, faith in a higher power, faith in the process, faith in the group. Living by the idiot, idiot that I talk about in my book. You don't have to be right, you just get to be you. And when you admit you're an idiot, you remove all the debates with your children. Act as if you matter. Take care of yourself and expect others to do the same. In fact, my experience is, you will not end up people that around you that will honor you unless you honor yourself first and you fight against the inclinations to be selfless. Good parenting is not the same as raising good children. Good parenting is its own reward. Good parenting is healthy living. And then changing the, the, the legacy of guilt. Right? Starting to be a, a generation that doesn't teach children that, that guilt is a a cornerstone of, of morality, but that love and compassion and courage and authenticity and empathy are. What I see most in families is over-identification over, or over-attachment rather than a lack of attachment. I explained that over-identification is the most severe form of poor attachment. Over-identification doesn't see the child as an other, but rather sees the child as an extension or reflection of the parent. In such a relationship dynamic, there's only one person, the parent. The child is altogether missing in the parent's mind. So the euphemism of loving too much, codependency, helicopter pairing is loving too much, it's not. It has nothing to do with love. It's based in anxiety, codependency, and poor self-development. We all struggle with it. And it's okay. And there's no shame in it. 
It's part of a human condition. Speaking on detachment, detachment is detaching from the person that we're about, uh, from the agony of involvement. It's releasing and detaching from a person or a problem in love. It's based on the premise that each person is responsible for himself, that we can't solve problems that aren't ours to solve, and that worrying won't help. Detachment involves present moment living, living in the here and now. It involves accepting reality, the facts. It requires faith in ourselves and a higher power or in other people and in the natural order and destiny, destiny of things in the world. Healthy detachment and healthy attachment are exactly the same thing. Sometimes attachment even motivates and frees people around us to begin to solve their own problems. And the good rule of thumb is you need to detach most when it seems least likely or the impossible thing to do. The exit from codependence and co-participation co comes from developing a relationship with yourself. From there, you'll be able to find and connect to your children and others and can establish a healthy relationship with their problems. Our relationship with others' problems is our responsibility. And when we lose our, res our serenity, it is our responsibility to gain it again. If you want more resources, like we talk about all the time, go to alanon.org. FamiliesAnonymous.org, Codependence.org. Melanie Beatty wrote the Bible on codependency. Uh, codependency No More. Um, and, and the Codependence Guide to the 12 Steps. So take a look at that. Karen Casey also wrote a great book, Codependence, Power of Detachment. Send in your questions now. I'll go through the upcoming slides, and then I'll get to the questions. I don't have a moderator, so I'll do my best. We ask all current parents to go to one of those 12-step support groups. You can also go to recovery.org, refugerecovery.org, excuse me, for a Buddhist-inspired recovery, or me.org for classes and resources in your area. All of these broadcasts are available on the podcast app on an iPhone, on your podcast app. Just so search Evoke Therapy Programs on an Android device using the SoundCloud app or on soundcloud.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy, and also you can follow the new Evoke Summit Lodge, the Intensive Lodge, at Evoke Summit Lodge. Find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs on Facebook. The Alumni Foundation you can find by ser searching Evoke Family Foundation on Facebook. You can also look at our blog. My book is available on Amazon. The warehouse is being restocked, so you can directly on Amazon through the seven new or new link right below the paperback square there. You can also buy a, a Kindle or an audiobook version. The next Finding You, if you want to do a deep dive into your work, the next Finding You will be March 27th through 31st. Parent Support Group, I'll get some more on the calendar. We only have one on the calendar right now. That's Monday, March 18th in New York. We ask all current parents to come to a workshop. The next one is March 23rd. Email melanie at evoke.com for more information. Also, you can go to our website to look at the pursuit strips. All right. Under symptoms of codependency, you describe powerlessness. Can you distinguish that from powerlessness in step one of the 12th? Fantastic question. Powerlessness in codependency is nothing I do makes a difference. It's weird. It's almost the exact opposite. Nothing I do makes a difference. I'm, I'm, I'm powerless to create a, a meaningful and rich and happy life. Powerlessness in the 12 steps is I'm powerless to control anything else i surrender to that idea and all i can do is work on myself all i can do is surrender to the fact that i, I i'm exhausted with trying to control how i feel how others feel and behave and so I, all i'm going to do is sit with myself feel with what is and surrender to it so powerlessness in the 12 steps is empowering and powerlessness in codependency is disempowering. However, if you practice recovery from codependency, your, your, your kind of hopeless powerlessness will turn into hopeful powerless because you'll stop trying to focus on controlling other people. It's a good question. It's, it, the wording is complicated. Really found this podcast helpful. Can you explain the link between the human tendency toward codependency? in the context of what we know about brain science. Well, 
happens is that we get rewarded in our brain by resolving conflict, by responding to stress. And so we become addicted to that, right? We, we end up finding ourselves in chaotic relationships where we're trying to solve over and over again the, the equation in our family. So it's why it's not uncommon for somebody who grew up in a chaotic, alcoholic family to end up in chaotic relationships later on in life. Or somebody who grew up in a codependent family to, to raise and create a codependent family because you're rewarded in your, your brain. The reward center is rewarded by, by resolving, by dealing with stressors. So you get addicted to chaos. I'm so happy to see this, to see how to get out of it. You mentioned something about chemically changing the brain. Can you expand on that a little bit? Also, under self-awareness deficits, you said something about dissociation and perfectionism. I used to say that I was a closet perfectionist. Now I know that I'm just one. Um, I, I can't speak a lot on, on the, the brain science of it. I just, it's not the right venue. Um, I'll do, a, I'll do a, a broadcast going forward. I've done one before on addiction in the brain. Um, and addiction in, in a co codependent isn't that different than addiction for somebody who's an addict or, or an alcoholic. Um, but just suffice it to say that, that neural pathways, that our, our, our style of attachment growing up becomes the one that we gravitate toward in our life. The level of differentiation is, is programmed, is, is right? If, if it won't make sense to us to be in a family, if you can imagine differentiation on a scale from one to 100, and let's say the family we grew up in, we grew up in was a 50 on that scale. 70s and 80s won't make sense to us, not without a lot of work. 30s and 40s we won't relate to or, or be attracted to. We will only be attracted to people between kind of 45 and 55 if we grew up in a family that was a 50. So our brain gets, gets accustomed to a, a way of relating, a, a way of dealing with chaos, with stress, a way of dealing with differentiation that makes sense to us. And 80s and 90s look to a 50 like disconnected and detached and uncaring. And 40s and 30s look like reactive and dependent and pathetic. So we end up becoming hardwired to a certain level. Moving up that scale takes a great amount of work. Such a timely topic. I'm in the middle of elapse. Great comment, by the way. I'm in the middle of relapse and my son is struggling. Mention he's thinking of getting sober. I know this is pre-contemplation, but I'm wanting to, to be in control, get him back into treatment. I've done so much work, however, and I can slip so easily. I'm going to end on that comment because that's really the work, right? It's not being doored and being done. It's saying when I can hear parents say I'm in the midst of a relapse or I'm getting triggered or I relapsed yesterday, I had a flare-up, that's the only work you could do. Because since it's a continuum, since it's a lifelong project, you'll never be perfect and flawless. So abandon that track altogether. So when a parent can talk about their own relapse, more than their child's relapse, when they can talk about their own recovery, their own disease, then you have a foundation to be able to relate, relate to the addict in a much, much more effective way. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that comment, that last comment. I appreciate it. All right, folks, sorry about the technical difficulties today. The next... Broadcast will be on entitlement. I'm on vacation next week. That's why I'm doing this on a Saturday. So it'll be on entitlement uh, Tuesday, March 12th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, that's a topic that I think is misunderstood and that a lot of people would describe today's youth as, as entitled. So I want to talk about the real underlying dynamics there. Look forward to that. Tuesday, March 12th at 7 p.m. Look forward to that. Hopefully this is a helpful point of contact. Hopefully this is Saturday since this was a Saturday afternoon. We had some people that could join that otherwise don't or, or can't join. Have a great week, and I'll talk to you after vacation. Take care. Bye-bye.